Great. So excited to see all the participants come in. Um, we'll wait a few, few moments for everybody to trickle in. We should really have some like music for the introduction part of it. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. The theme song, if anybody writes music. But I see some friends' names coming in, some people that have done other talks and done trainings. This will be a fun thing. And feel free to use the chat function if you want to introduce yourself um, and say where you're from, and also the Q&A format as well for targeted questions. Give it like another minute or two. What do you all think? Yeah, yeah we can a little while. Yeah, I'm still. Can I ask both of you guys about your beautiful background photos? I'm, Maya, I think I see some like some like going on scrub. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I honestly don't even know where this picture is from. I think it's from CNPS Media. Nice, very beautiful. Like, oh, to represent coastal. And this is normally my front yard in Casadero. Oh, awesome. That's such a treat. I wish I had a front yard like that right now. It's very hot today in LA. I know it's, it's hot everywhere in California right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm in Santa Cruz right by the beach and it's really, I think it's like 80 right now, 82. Oh yeah. That's hot for the beach in Santa Cruz. Yeah. Well, um, everybody's rolling in. We'll give them a couple of minutes just till the numbers start to stabilize. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of people saying hi from different places. It's really cool to see um, that we have people from all over the state visiting today. I saw somebody from Woodland. I was born in Woodland, so what's up? Oakland, <laughs> I used to live in Oakland. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, San Diego, yeah. my husband's from San Diego. <laughs> Ooh, 100 degrees, girl. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah, it doesn't really quite feel like spring, huh? It feels more like summer. Yeah, we jumped right into summer, but hopefully we'll get our spring back next week. We'll see. I know. I, I think at least up here, there's supposed to be rain on Monday. We'll see. Oh, nice. Yeah, we got really lucky and got a little um, a little rain last week, which was a treat. I thought we were going to cap out at like 10 inches down here this season, but we got a good, good steady deluge there for a day. I'm all deluge. Yeah, I've been living in Southern California for too long, guys. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Do you want to go ahead and get started then? Yeah. Should I just jump right in with the. the well, let's do an opener. Oh, yeah. Go for it, Maya. Anne Marie, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Benz. I'm the Horticulture Programs Manager for CMPS. I'm out of Oakland today, although this is often my front yard in Casadero that you're seeing here. We appreciate all of you being here to learn more about nurseries and please use the chat to chat amongst yourselves and I will be trying to answer questions in the comment. And Maya? Yeah, um, I'm Maya Argamon and I am the Horticulture Program Coordinator at CNPS. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited about this webinar because, you know, with spring, it can be really overwhelming going to nurseries and, um, you know, choosing what plants to have in your space. So, um, I'm really excited about this one and I am happy to introduce Nicole Calhoun. Um, she is our presenter today um, and she is the owner of Artemisia Nursery, which is a wonderful sweet nursery in LA um, or Los Angeles. Um, and she has a certificate in ornamental horticulture from Merritt College in Oakland and is also a certified California naturalist. And she's currently working towards her licensure as a landscape architect of the UCLA Extension Program. So she's been working with plants for over a decade, first as a maintenance gardener and as a nursery worker and a garden designer. And when she's not at the nursery, you can find her playing bass with the California Native Plant Band, Sage Against the Machine. Um, yeah, so welcome, Nicole, and thanks so much for speaking to us about, you know, nursery shopping and just the general guide to buying native plants. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'll go ahead and pull up the uh, presentation here. Great. Okay, is that coming through okay on everyone mm -hmm. there? Okay, excellent. Yeah, so, 
Um, yeah, thank you to the folks at CNPS for hosting this great series of webinars. And thank you, Maya, for inviting me to come and talk with everyone today about Nursery Shopping 101. Um, I also wanna thank all of you guys that are here uh, just joining us for the day. If you have any questions while I'm presenting, please go ahead and drop them in the chat or the Q&A. And, um, and then uh, Maya and Anne-Marie can either um, interject and pose those to me as I'm presenting, or we can circle back at the end for a little Q&A session. Um, so my name is Nicole Calhoun. And as Maya mentioned, I work at Artemisia Nursery. Here's a little location map so you can see where I am. Um, we're in Northeast Los Angeles. And we specialize in California native plants, but full disclosure, we're not purists. We do also carry herbs and vegetables, house plants and succulents, uh, but native plants are definitely at the core of what we do at Artemisia. And while we have a very intimately proportioned space, as you can tell probably from this photo, um, we do our best to offer a really thoughtful and diverse selection of native plants uh, for all the folks in our community. Um, before I get too much further into the body of the talk, I wanted to give you a little bit more background about where I'm coming from, just so you have a sense of that. Um, so these photos are actually from my mom's garden uh, in Albuquerque. My mom is a lifelong gardener, and I grew up helping her out in the garden. Um, in our small home in Long Beach, where I lived as a kid, she grew tons of heirloom vegetables and herbs heirloom irises and daylilies and all kinds of Mediterranean climate plants. Um, we never used pesticides unless you count the saucer of beer that she would leave out to tempt the slugs to their happy doom. So we always had lots of cool critters in the garden too. And um, when I entered the horticultural field as a young adult, I was already primed to want to grow food and climate appropriate ornamentals and be surrounded by wildlife. But it wasn't until several years into studying horticulture and working in the field, first as a gardener and then as a nursery worker, that I realized the significance of native plants had slowly seeped into my consciousness. And I began to truly appreciate the intimacy and complexity of the relationships between native plants and wildlife. That's a big part of why I do the work that I do now. I am absolutely fascinated and inspired by these relationships. And I want to protect and restore them wherever possible and to share the enthusiasm that I hold for them with my fellow humans. So that's more or less my origin story for coming to love native plants. One of the fun things about working at a native plant nursery is that I get to hear what draws other people to working with native plants. So sometimes I hear like kind of like intellectual types and designers calling out the way that native plants evoke a particular sense of place. I used to not really understand that one, but once you go on a hike through some of the most naturally beautiful places in the world and then compare it to something like this, oh yeah, you start to think, I want a piece of this in my yard. Sometimes I hear thrifty folks and folks with deep-seated concerns about sustainability cite how native plants can be really great for conserving water in the landscape. Some folks love the array of fragrances in our native flora. Um, in this uh, montage of photos, we've got some verbena that smells super sweet. We've got that uh, California sagebrush or cowboy's cologne. Got that white sage and the woolly blue curls. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. It's a uh, SoCal endemic, but it smells kind of like blueberry candy. It's like a really great fragrance. Um, so sometimes people get really excited about our super blooms and some of our superlatives, right? We have a uh, I think like the largest tree, the tallest tree, the oldest tree, we like to claim all of those right here in California. So we're very proud of our flora, right? Sometimes people get interested in native plants because they could be sources for food and medicine, like the um, golden currant there has really tasty berries, um, salix or willows, those guys are basically a natural source of aspirin. Um, elderberries, you can eat the berries when they're ripe, don't eat them when they're not ripe because they're toxic. And uh, wild roses, you can uh, make a nice sort of tea from the rose hips. Um, or like me, people get really excited about attracting wildlife. Um, so we've got a monarch butterfly on some monarch della there, monarch caterpillar on some narrow leaf milkweed, a really cool bee fly. So that's a uh, fly that likes to kind of disguise itself as a bee hanging out on a California bush sunflower. 
And then this bottom right photo, that's a, a little caterpillar for probably like a type of um, like a gossamer winged butterfly, like a blue or a hair streak. Um, and it's actually eating the flowers of a buckwheat. So uh, sometimes when we talk about larval host plants, sometimes it means that we sacrifice some of our blooms in order to support our, our butterfly friends. Um, sometimes people like my husband, Richard, just want to have fun exploring and experimenting with new plants. Um, so I'm just curious to get a read on all of you guys that are here tonight. And I was curious what gets you excited about gardening with native plants. So um, I think Maya may have prepared a poll for us. So um, if you guys want to kind of jump on there and let us know what you're into, it would be kind of cool to see like what's drawing you guys to native plants. And maybe I can uh, speak to that a little bit too. Nice. Oh, this is, oh, this is really fun watching this live. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see, I see wildlife winning. I'm gonna mute you. Yeah. All of these are great reasons though. <laughs> and I made it so that people can choose more than one option also. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. yeah Cause why choose just one? There's so many great reasons to garden with natives. This is awesome, you guys. Cool. Really appreciate the feedback. <laughs> Let me know when you want me to end the poll also. Yeah, I think this gives That's us like a good, good sense of things. Yeah, so it's, it's like a pretty broad distribution, right? We're all here for probably multiple reasons, lots of different reasons. Thank you guys so much for chiming in. Um, I really appreciate it. Cool. So, um, I promise this is actually all going to tie into nursery shopping 101. <laughs> okay, so I find um, that it's really helpful to have some guiding thoughts about why you're gardening with native plants to help inform your selection of plants at the nursery. So I'll give you guys an example here. Um, let's say that your prime directive is to conserve water and you're looking for a plant for a hot, dry, sunny spot in your garden. Uh, you might do a little bit of research and decide that Balea multiradiata or desert marigold is the perfect plant for you. You call around and unfortunately, nobody has it in stock. So you decide you'll just head over to your closest native plant nursery and see what they do have. You walk in and the first thing that catches your eye is this pop of yellow. You walk over to it and, oh, it turns out it's a type of monkey flower. So you've got some Erythranthi guttata here in full bloom. And uh, they're even on sale, two for one. Oh, so uh, yeah, we've got some kind of monkey flower here. So you start reading the label and you're like, wait, seep monkey flower? Hmm, so you read a little bit further and uh, turns out that this is not a dry land monkey flower. This guy wants constantly moist soils and even grows as an aquatic plant. So here it is with some of its riparian buddies and a photo of it out on the trail there, growing right out of a seep. Okay, so you're gonna have to hit the brakes right there. That's a really cool plant, but it's not gonna be the most water conserving option for that hot, dry, sunny spot you had in mind. So you might be better off checking out some sages and pinstamens and desert mallows instead, right? On the other hand, let's say that your prime directive is to grow food or medicine. You might head over to your local nursery looking for Sambucus or elderberry. But alas, when you show up, maybe someone else is walking out with that last elderberry tree. I mean, you could be like, look, is that a Western tanager? And try to like jack that elderberry from them. Or you could just let it go. And uh, what do you know? Maybe it'll turn out that they actually have some golden currant in stock and you could go with that instead. So basically having a strong guiding principle behind why you're shopping for native plants will help to inform your decisions about which plants to purchase, even if someone throws you a curveball, like buying that last elderberry out from under you. Okay, so let's say you have a strong sense of your guiding principles and you're super pumped to go, uh, go shopping and get some native plants in the ground. Are you ready? Well, first thing you need to do is make sure that you have a working understanding of your site conditions. Um, this will help to ensure that you are only selecting plants that are compatible with your site. When you lean into your site conditions, it's like the wind is at your back and you are much more likely to have success with your plants. 
like I've heard Maya say before, don't fight your sight. So before you hit the nursery, make sure you can answer the following questions. What are the dimensions of the space? If you're not sure, get out there with a tape measure or hop on Google Earth and use their measuring tool. Or at the very least, just like walk across the space and um, count the number of strides that it takes. Make sure you write it down so you don't forget. You also need to be able to answer how much sun does your area get? But don't forget that the sun exposure can change significantly through the seasons. So for example, here in Los Angeles, um, on summer solstice, an object's shadow is only one fifth of the object's height. So a five foot fence in the middle of summer will only have a one foot shadow. On the other hand, at noon on winter solstice, that same fence will have a shadow that's one and a half times um, its height. So that same five foot fence now has a seven and a half foot shadow. Some of you guys have lived in the same spot for over a year and have had the opportunity to, to observe the patterns of sun and shade as they shift over time. So you can answer this question about sun exposure from your own direct observation. If you haven't had the opportunity to observe the sun moving across the space, take the time to think it through. Observe the sun in the morning, midday, and afternoon, and then consider how this will change at different times of the year. All right, so another huge factor that people sometimes overlook is their soil type. Sometimes people think like, oh, it doesn't really matter. I'll just put a different kind of soil into the planting hole, or my existing soil is so crappy anyway, I have to amend it, et cetera, et cetera. Don't fall into those traps. So many of our native plants are adapted to thin nutrient poor soils. Got heavy clay? So many awesome native plants love clay soil. Embrace your soil type, get to know it and find the plants that are adapted to your existing soil. And you will have so much more success than if you try to fight the nature of your soil. Okay, cool. So maybe you're with me in concept there, but you're not really sure what your soil type is. I mean, maybe it's kind of like yellowish brown and it's hard to get a shovel into it. Does that mean it's clay or compacted sand? You can always get your soil tested professionally, but maybe that's not in the budget or maybe you just want a quick and dirty assessment. So there's two things that you can do that are pretty easy to start learning about your soil. The first one is to do a drainage test. So you can basically uh, dig a hole about the size of a shovel head or like a one gallon pot. It's about six inches by six inches. If your soil is pretty parched, you might wanna go ahead and fill it with water, let it drain. And then the second time around, fill it with water and time how long it takes for that water to drain out of the hole. And then that starts to give you a sense of your soil drainage and your soil composition. So the faster the soil drains, the sandier it is, the slower it drains, the more clay content is in your soil. Um, and you may also be dealing with some compaction issues. So that's just good to be aware of. Um, a lot of sites you're gonna find that your soil is draining, you know, it takes like 10 minutes to an hour, somewhere in there is pretty normal. If it's like only drains in a few minutes or you can't even get the hole to hold water, you've got like a very sandy soil. If it takes hours and hours and hours to drain, got a really heavy clay soil. That's incredibly valu valuable information because then you can really lean into plants that prefer those soil types. Okay, so the second way to test your soil involves getting your hands a little bit dirtier. Um, this is called a ribbon test. So the way it works is you scoop up a handful of soil and get it evenly moist. So you're kind of like squishing it around in your hand for a few minutes. Um, if there's any like little rocks or bits of other stuff in there, try to discard those. Um, first, see if you can make a ball out of the soil. If it crumbles apart and won't stay in a ball when you open your hand, then you have pure sand. If you can form a ball, you have something else. There's probably like a little bit of clay in there or some silt, right? Um, it could be loamy sand, could be clay, could be something in between. Then try to extrude the wet soil into a ribbon across your forefinger. The longer the ribbon, can get before it breaks under its own weight, the more clay you have in your soil. It does take a little bit of practice to get this technique down, but it's pretty fun to do it. It's also a little faster than a drainage test, especially if you have clay soil. 
Um, so I do encourage you guys to all get out there and get your hands dirty. Uh, just make sure that you have a sink or a hose nearby for afterwards. I've definitely made that mistake at the beginning of a consult and spent an hour with like just dirt caked on my hands while I'm talking to someone about their garden. Okay. Um, also, don't forget that urban soils are often mosaics. So you may want to repeat these tests in different parts of your yard to see if the soil type varies or remains fairly consistent throughout the site. Okay, so the last big question I want you to be able to answer before you go to the nursery is how are the plants gonna be getting water? Are they relying on natural rainfall alone? How much rainfall is that anyway? I think for LA, we were already talking about that, right? Our average seasonal rainfall used to be 15 inches a year. I think they actually just updated it to 14 inches a year. So we're heading towards drier climate, right? Um, other things to consider for water, like does your neighbor up the hill run their sprinklers three times a week to water their lawn? Um, do you maybe have a rain garden or a bioswale that captures seasonal rainfall from the roof of your house? Um, that's what I have in my front yard. That's that baby elderberry, <clears throat> that baby elderberry tree there um, is in a rain garden that's being fed by um, direct rainfall and then reinforced by water that's coming off the roof of my house and then piped over there. Um, you can kind of see that little white, that little white guy um, at the base of the rain garden is the, uh, the outlet, the drain outlet for that. So that elderberry, instead of getting 14 inches of rain every year, it's probably getting more like 50 inches of rain because all that extra rain that it gets um, from the from the roof. Um, so yeah, you could be tripling or quadrupling your average seasonal rainfall um, if you're using rain gardens and bioswales. Um, do you have an irrigation system in place or are you maybe hand watering? Um, in the bottom left there, you can see our I guess it's like a hybrid of an irrigation system and hand watering approach where we have a sprinkler head on a hose and we're watering our, uh, our back garden there at the nursery. Um, yeah, so all of these factors can come into play when you're deciding which plants to purchase at the nursery. Okay, so are you ready to go to the nursery now? I think so. Of course, you could always do more research. Um, and if you're planting an entire garden, you probably want to spend some time developing a, um, a plant palette of complementary plants. But let's circle back to that later. For now, let's go on our first trip to the nursery. So maybe you did some deep research and you know exactly which plants you want, right down to the cultivar and the pot size. Or maybe visiting the nursery is part of that research. You want to meet these plants in real life so that you can get a better sense of them before you make any final decisions. Or maybe you're walking into the nursery with nothing in mind, but some thoughtful parameters informed by your guiding principles and your site conditions. Personally, I like being somewhere in between all of those headspaces. I find that it's really helpful to have a strong idea of what I'm looking for, but to stay flexible about the details so that I don't get flummoxed if that exact species I want is out of stock, or if something else I hadn't thought of catches my eye and turns out to be an even better fit for my garden. So you're ready to go to the nursery. Maybe you already have a favorite native plant nursery, or maybe you're not even sure where there is a native plant nursery near you. So um, calscape.org and the folks at your local CNPS or California Native Plant Society chapter are two of the best resources for finding out about nurseries near you that specialize in California native plants. So this is Calscape's map of nurseries that carry native plants. And some of them carry only native plants. Like um, near us, we have the Theodore Payne Foundation in Sun Valley. They exclusively carry native plants. And then others like our nursery, Artemisia, or Annie's Annuals up in the Bay Area, carry a mix of native and non-native plants. Some of the nurseries on this list are retail nurseries like Theodore Payne, Artemisia, and Annie's Annuals. We all sell plants to the general public. Some of these nurseries are wholesale only and they do not sell to the general public. So if you try to drive up there, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. Um, but luckily on Calscape, if you click on the name of the nursery on that list on the right-hand side, a little box will pop up with more information about the nursery including whether it is a retail or wholesale nursery. 
You can also use Cowscape to locate nurseries that grow a certain type of plant. Just keep in mind when you're using this resource that just because a nursery has listed um, as growing a certain plant on Cowscape, for instance, uh, we sometimes grow um, Dendromicon herfordii, the island bush poppy, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have it in stock right now. So yeah, probably wanna just double check before you roll over for a specific plant. The other thing is, um, even if we do have it in stock, it may or may not be in prime condition. So if you see a nursery listed on Cowscape as carrying a certain plant, that just means that they have grown that plant at some point in the past. Okay. Um, ever since COVID, a lot of nurseries have developed online stores. I know that's what we did like the very first week of COVID. Um, so what's cool about the online store is you can check and see what we currently have in stock. So I have a couple images from our online shop and then from Annie's annuals because she has a great online storefront. Um, the information on these online shop websites tends to be fairly up to date, but um, it's not always the full picture of what's going on. So for instance, at my nursery, we receive deliveries from our growing partners like three to four times every week. So our availability is constantly shifting and rotating. Ultimately, the best way to check stock before you head to the nursery is to call or email and ask if the plants you're looking for are currently available. The folks at the nursery should be able to tell you not only what they have in stock, but what quality it's currently in and what options they have on hand for plants that are currently out of stock or not looking so prime right now. They should also be able to tell you what plants are in the production pipeline that will be arriving in the coming weeks. So maybe they're out of something right now, but they know that it's, they have a new crop that's just, just a couple weeks out. If you just hold on, you'll be able to get some. Um, or which plants are maybe only available as a special order. Um, sometimes people, you know, we get people asking for like a very specific plant or maybe a plant in a larger size that we wouldn't normally stock, but happen to know a grower who's growing some, so maybe it can help hook it up, right? Um, not every nursery has the capacity to offer that level of customer service, but if they do, that's a really great sign that you're in good hands. So let's say you just wanna see for yourself what's available and you decide to go to the nursery without calling ahead. This is a totally valid approach, especially because you can shop based on which plants are looking the freshest and the healthiest. Just don't forget our nursery shopping checklist. When you are freestyling your plant selection based on what is available at the nursery, this is where those guiding thoughts and that knowledge of your site conditions really comes into play. When you get to the nursery, make sure you don't adopt a Great Dane if your garden is basically a balcony with some pots. Stick with the Chewinis instead. Okay, so now let's talk about plant quality. So what do I mean when I talk about picking out the plants that are the most prime? Okay, let me frame this for you guys. So when you're a plant, life in a container can be very challenging. You have limited space for your roots, you go through the nutrients in your soil very quickly, and you're way more exposed to the elements, especially those big temperature swings because your little root ball is just hanging out in a little plastic container, right? So generally, the younger a plant is, the less time that has been institutionalized, if you will, the more vigorous it will be when it enters your garden. The longer that a plant has been grown in container culture, the more opportunity there is for something to go wrong along the way. So let's look at some examples here. Um, in general, you wanna look for dense, bushy growth and a reasonable proportion between the above ground parts and the below ground parts or the shoots and the roots. So the coffee berry on the left here, it's bigger. So it must be better, right? No. <laughs> so that guy has clearly been in the pot for too long. It's much larger than the one on the right. And in this case, that does not mean better. The coffee berry on the right has this nice dense bushy growth and the shoots are much more proportional to the roots. You can also see the quality of that growth looks very different, right? The one on the left looks like it's got some stress going on. Those leaves are discoloring. The one on the right is just like full of life, lots of green. 
Um, so another way to assess plant health is to look for signs of new growth. This can vary seasonally, but if you see new growth, that's generally a good sign um, indicating that the plant is healthy and actively growing. So here's two coffee berries that are actually both part of that overgrown crop. The one on the left has a tiny bit of new growth. You know, it could maybe make it if we get it in the ground or a larger pot, but it's definitely a plant rescue situation. Whereas the one on the right, I mean, I could see some stressed out leaves from last year. The plant's basically pulling nutrients out of those leaves to push towards its new growth. Um, but it's doing that a lot more successfully than the one on the left, right? So you see a lot of new growth coming on to that guy. So of the two of them, that one on the right is better off, but really the little guy from the first slide is the, is the one to go for. Okay. Um, if you're having trouble determining the health of the plant based on what you see on top, you can ask a nursery worker for assistance viewing the root ball. Ideally, the plant should be fully rooted with roots reaching the bottom of the pot and it should have minimal circling roots. Um, always ask your nursery worker for permission, guys, or for assistance on this. Don't just get in there and start pulling plants out of the pots. Okay. Um, so if a four inch or one gallon plant is fully rooted, it should be possible for a trained professional, trained professional to remove the entire root ball from the container without the root ball collapsing or crumbling. If the root ball is falling apart in that size container, when you try to pull it out, the plant's not fully rooted yet. Um, then if, uh, if you pull it out and like that poor guy in the bottom right there, that one, like I could even tell before I pulled it out of the pot, you could see the roots like bulging against the plastic. Uh, that one's been in a container for way, way too long. And those roots are circling, circling, circling. So that plant is very, very overgrown. Okay, cool. So um, we've talked about the health benefits of starting with like a smaller plant, right? Uh, they tend to be more vigorous and there have been fewer opportunities for something to go wrong during their time in container culture. Another benefit to starting with smaller plants is that you can stretch your budget much further. So check out this white sage. You can get the same plant in a four inch pot for six bucks, a one gallon pot for 10 bucks, or a five gallon pot for 30 bucks. And guess what? These guys are so fast growing and the younger plants tend to be so vigorous that if you plant them all at the same time, there's a pretty good chance that they will all be a similar size within a year or two. So if your budget is around 30 bucks, instead of that one five gallon white sage, you might consider getting three one gallon plants or maybe even five four inch plants. Ooh. Okay. So there's definitely some flexibility with this concept of starting small, right? For trees, starting small might mean starting with a five gallon or a 15 gallon rather than a 24 inch box or a 36 inch box, right? Um, and there are times that you may want a larger plant to help provide shade or privacy or to match the size of another plant in your garden. So in that case, just take extra time to examine the plant and make sure you are getting a healthy, high quality specimen. Okay, once you've selected all the plants that you wanna purchase and you're ready to check out, take a moment to make sure that every plant you are purchasing aligns with your guiding principles, is compatible with your site conditions and is in good health. This will set you up for success when you get home and start putting these guys in the ground. Okay, speaking of setting you up for success, I didn't go into site prep. Okay, so this whole flow that we just talked about is based on the idea that your site is ready to receive plants. If that is not the case, then I highly encourage you guys to prep your site before purchasing any plants. Keeping these guys alive while they are in containers requires constant care and attention. It's a very different ball game than when they are in the ground. That's my job. Your job is to get these guys installed and established and then enjoy them as they flourish in your garden. Okay, so earlier in the talk, 
I mentioned that we could circle back around to the idea of researching plants for those of you that like to do the deep research before you commit to purchasing anything. Um, so these are some of my go-to resources. Um, both of the websites that I have on here, uh, Las Palitas Nursery and Cowscape are incredibly robust. They have lots of great information, not just about the plants themselves, but also about the plant communities and associated wildlife. Um, but in this day and age of excessive screen time, nothing really beats having a book in your hands. It feels a lot better to whip a book out when you're at the nursery than to interrupt that immersive outdoor experience with some screen time. So I highly recommend checking out this uh, book by Carol Bornstein, David Frost, and Bart O'Brien, California Native Plants for the Garden. If you don't already have a copy, get yourself a copy, take it with you everywhere you go. It's an excellent book. Um, but at the end of all that, I still say nature is the best teacher. So make sure that you guys are getting out there to visit native plants in the wild. Um, another great place to see native plants is in different gardens, right? So if you guys wanna take a moment to think about your favorite places to go and see native plants, whether it's a hiking trail near you or your favorite botanic garden, it'd be great if you could go ahead and drop that information in the chat um, that way other folks in your area can get out there and see these guys in the wild and in cultivation. Um, so one of my favorite spots is Arlington Garden in Pasadena. Um, I also love California Botanic Garden in Claremont and Tilden Botanic Garden in Berkeley. I used to go there when I lived in the Bay Area. Um, over closer to me in LA here, we have the Theodore Payne Foundation. They have a great garden tour coming up. That's an excellent opportunity for folks in the LA area to see native plants in a bunch of different gardens. And I'm really excited to see what other places you guys all recommend. Okay, so I think the one last thing I wanted to touch on is developing a planting palette. Um, so as you guys know, I also do work as a garden designer and I am currently working towards licensure as a landscape architect. Um, I come to those fields with a background in horticulture and as a naturalist, so I tend to go pretty deep on developing my plant palettes. Plants are never an afterthought for me. It's always like a, an origin point. Um, to me, this is a, um, it's at, at an intersection of like a creative, expressive um, process and a process of scientific observation and exploration. Everyone who engages in developing planting palettes and designing gardens is gonna have their own flow, including each of you guys. So here are a couple of things that have helped me to guide my flow. Let naturally existing plant communities be your guide. Native plants thrive when they are within their communities. Cowscape and Las Palitas Nursery both offer a wealth of information about companion plants and plant communities. I also recommend checking out the book, um, Designing California Native Gardens, The Plant Community Approach to Artful Ecological Gardens. That's by um, Glenn Keeter and uh, Faber. This is an excellent resource that is full of examples of actual gardens that were designed using the plant community approach. So you can see how the natural communities of plants influence the choices that the designers made when they put these gardens together. Another strategy um, for developing your planting palette has to do with thinking about your site over time. Lean into the natural succession of your site. The landscapes that we work in are often what ecologists would call disturbed sites. In natural systems, some species are very effective at colonizing disturbed sites. Think annual wildflowers like poppies and lupins and fast growing perennials like California sagebrush. The very presence of these species starts to change the soil ecology in ways that make it more welcoming to other more particular species within the same or adjacent plant communities, including what ecologists might call climax species like our native oak trees. So if you want to transform a disturbed site say like the lawn in your front yard into an oak woodland, 
One strategy is to start by planting fast growing chaparral or coastal sage scrub species that naturally overlap into the oak woodland communities and then plant young oak trees in their company. Flesh out the garden with annuals and short-lived perennials, such as California bush sunflower, that can offer beauty and habitat, while the slower plants, such as manzanitas and coffee berries, gradually fill in. Your garden will look pretty full pretty quickly, thanks to all those short-lived, fast-growing plants, and then it will gradually transform in character over time as the slower growers mature and emerge as more prominent features in the landscape. Then you can start planting an understory of plants like hummingbird sage or hoikara, because now you have a canopy where you didn't before. Your garden will constantly evolve little by little over time, which is part of the pleasure of gardening. All right, well, I hope that gives you guys some good food for thought. And I really appreciate you lending me your ears. So now I'm gonna lend you mine and I would love to take any questions that you guys have. One of the first ones is, what is the second book you mentioned there? Oh yeah, that's, um, let me grab that title for you again. Um, Designing California Native Gardens. And then the subtitle is The Plant Community Approach to Artful Ecological Gardens. Great. And we had some people asking about what are the best seasons for buying and the best seasons for planting and what if you're planting outside of the best seasons? Totally, great, those are great questions. Okay, so typically the way that I think about it is um, in most of California with most of our native plants, the easiest time to get things established is during the cool season. Um, so sometimes people interpret that as fall, sometimes they interpret it as winter, maybe it's even early spring. Um, the longer that your plants have in the cool season before they have to deal with their first summer, the more likely they are to successfully get through that very challenging experience. Um, so there's no like hard and fast, right or wrong there. There's a gradient of easy and challenging. Um, so there are also some exceptions. Uh, right now, we're at the beginning of April, right? And today it was like 95 degrees in LA. So it's not an optimal planting day for most of our native species. However, um, we've been getting a lot of folks calling up asking about milkweed. They've been asking since December. Do you have milkweed yet? Native milkweed, I want the native milkweed. It has been dormant until like a week ago. So it's been sleeping all through the cool season. And I don't know about you, but when you go to the nursery and you see like an empty pot that says milkweed on it, you're like, but is there really milkweed in there? So with milkweed, that's a great example of a plant where it's actually better to wait until like mid spring when the plants are leafed out on top. And those guys do generally really well being planted like April, May. Um, so they can handle being planted out this time of year. A couple other strategies to keep in mind, if you are kind of pushing your planting season, you're planting like later into the summer, which I have done. I have planted in all the months. It's way easier in the fall. You can kind of like plant stuff and walk away. In the summer, you're out there and you're like, it's like a, it's like a thriller. It's like a suspense movie. You're just like, are they gonna make it? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So you gotta be ready for that. Um, but yeah, if you're gonna be pushing into the summer for planting, um, a few things to keep in mind. Try to plant on a relatively cool day. So be looking at that weather forecast. Don't do it on that day that we hit 115. If 90 is your relatively cool day, then plant when it's 90, that's better than 115. Um, work with plants that can tolerate warm, wet soil conditions. So the fundamental conflict that arises when you're trying to establish plants in the warm season is you have to water them. They need water, they have to have water but some of our native plants do not tolerate warm, wet soil conditions. Think manzanita, cyanothus, they're not gonna be down. Some of our plants do tolerate warm, wet soil conditions. So those would be the plants to lean into for planting that time of year. So some of those plants include riparian species because they're always down for water. They're totally cool with it. So if you maybe have a rain garden, 
Um, you could be planting juncus, you could be planting elderberry, you could be planting ribes. As long as you're comfortable giving those guys plenty of water, then they can potentially make it through that warm, wet soil condition. The other um, palette to start looking into are some of our desert natives. So a lot of the coastal natives are in a Mediterranean climate where they're used to receiving water during the cool season and dry conditions during the summer. But a lot of the plants from our deserts actually receive summer monsoons, right? So it's like hot out there, it's the middle of summer, and then it starts raining and those plants are like, woo, party on, let's do it. Um, so they're actually able to tolerate the warm, wet soil conditions. So that might be like Sprousia ambigua, Butylon palmeri, um, maybe Artemisia tridentata. So some of those guys you might have more success with if you're gonna try to plant during the summer. Um, the other thing you can be doing is trying to like erect temporary shade structures or using like really large nurse rocks, like a small boulder, um, like on the sunniest side of the plant to create like a little cooling zone for the roots to hang out. So those are all strategies you can use. You can also be mulching pretty heavily. Just don't smother the base of the plant. But if you have a blanket of mulch on your soil, that's going to help to moderate the temperature of the soil. And a lot of plants can handle like having heat on their tops as long as their roots are cool. So those are all different strategies. Of course, if you're doing like a full garden and you want to save yourself the heartache, try to wait for the cool season. But if you're just like, just can't help yourself, you want to get out there, you want to plant stuff, even though it's the warm season, those are the strategies that I would employ. Great. Yeah. It's better if you can plant when the plants want would naturally be coming up. Yeah. Um, have an emergency. Less stress all around. Yeah. <laughs> don't do well because they don't want to get wet during the summer. Yeah. Um, how about this? If, a, if you get a plant from a nursery and then it's not doing well, you're starting to have trouble. Mm -hmm. um, can you go ask the nursery? Can you look for help there? What have I done? Yeah. I think it probably depends on the nursery. So I can only speak from my personal experience as a nursery worker. I'll say two things about this. One is we don't take plants back once you take it because we don't know what you did to it. Did you leave in your car for 24 hours? That's on you. Um, however, we are always super down to help you troubleshoot what's going on with your plant. So if you get a plant from us and you take it home, and it's just not doing well, maybe it's losing some leaves, whatever, take a picture and send it to us. We wanna know what's happening and we wanna support you because we want you to be successful growing this plant. Um, so yeah, definitely it's worth reaching out to the nursery and just see what sort of support you might be able to get. A lot of times plants do experience transplant shock. So sometimes you'll see you know, some signs of stress um, and then the plant will bounce back. Other times there could be something more serious going on and maybe the plant starts to decline and then keeps declining. So um, sometimes we can help you troubleshoot, like does it need more water, does it need less water? I'd say a really common issue for um, folks that are new to gardening with native plants is a lot of times we hear like, they don't wanna be watered too much, don't overwater, you know? And a lot of times people will <laughs> have had this happen where people take the plant home Maybe they haven't even planted it in the ground yet. Two weeks later, they call me they're like, why did my plant die? I didn't water it. I'm like, oh no, it, it, well, it's in the pot and while it's freshly planted, it does still need water. You gotta, you gotta water it. Um, so it's like basically starting to understand the, the difference between like caring for it in a container, caring for it while you're establishing it versus caring for it once it's established in the landscape. And if you're not clear what that means, then talk to your nursery worker about it. Ask them for recommendations to um, successfully establish your plant, especially with reference to your specific site conditions. Um, the frequency that you water may depend on like how much sun and shade and what type of soil you have. So if you have that information with you, chat up your nursery worker, let them know like, hey, I'm kind of new to this. I'm planting the Ceanothus for the first time. I have clay soil. It's gonna be in part sun, part shade. Like how often should I water? Great, thanks. Um, we have somebody asking, they hear that sage can be short-lived. And I, it, I was having a talk just this morning with somebody who's on, on this call about Cleveland sage occasionally being like a decade long plant. Sure, yeah, um, that's a great question. So yeah, I think it depends um, quite a bit on the site conditions. So um, I've heard this analogy before relating um, the way that like, 
you choose to live your lifestyle in terms of like diet compared to like how long a plant lives. So for instance, um, a Cleveland sage in clay soil that's getting water all the time. Oh, it's going to get beefy. It's going to look good. It's going to flower a lot. And then it's going to die like in just a few years. Whereas um, the same plant grown under very like thin soils with minimal water, it's going to survive like year after year. It's only going to grow little by little by little, but it's going to live for many, many more years. Right. So that's kind of like maybe someone who's like eating hamburgers and chocolate cake every day. They're loving life. You know, they're having a great time, but they may not live as long as someone who's like eating like a couple lentils every day. You know what I'm saying? So I think there's some of that at play. Um, but yeah, I would say arguably like sages are not as long lived as like oak trees. So yeah, there's definitely just like a natural, um, some of these plants are shorter lived than others. Mm -hmm. Good point. All plants have an expected lifespan. Well, some of them we don't know yet. They all fail. Yeah, they are out and it can be quite variable. But if you plant the one that is regionally appropriate to your soil, your conditions, you're more likely to have success. Yes. Did somebody ask um, what perennial plants would make great pioneer plants? Um, so again, it does depend on your site, but in my area, perennial plants that I use as pioneer species are um, Artemisia californica. So that's the California sagebrush. Um, I also use sages like Salvia mellifera, Salvia apiana, Salvia leucophila, and the cultivars um, as uh, pioneer species. They grow very quickly and um, buckwheats as well. So I think that's a really nice trifecta for where I live, right? I'm in like this kind of coastal sage scrub chaparral interface, which is probably where a good chunk of you guys are too. That's like where most of the populated regions of California are located. Um, so that like sage, sagebrush and buckwheat trio is really nice. Um, Bacchus, the um, coyote brush is also a very fast growing perennial and Ceanothus is as well. It's kind of fun to note actually Ceanothus, um, those guys are nitrogen fixers. Um, so they're really great pioneer species because the soil doesn't have to have any nitrogen. They'll figure it out from, for themselves. Um, yeah, and there's lots more, but those are some, some great starting points for sure. If you planted native plants thus fall, this is gonna be their first summer. It's looking like it's gonna be a rough summer and it was a little bit dry of a winter. Um, what should they be doing now to make sure that they're ready for summer? Great question. I'm glad you asked this now and not in the middle of the summer. So um, if they've been in the ground since the fall, try to assess like what percentage of your ideal rainfall happened naturally and what's the gap that you need to make up by hand watering or irrigating to get them to that optimal this is what we would in a perfect world have as our annual rainfall um, and water them now. I mean, maybe not like right now, cause right now there's a heat wave, but like next week when it cools off again, soak them deep, get that, get that water just like deep, deep, deep in the soil, let those roots go deep, let the plants collect it, let their roots like find the nooks and crannies where the water's gonna be hanging out over the summer. Um, and then that way you won't be forced to water them when it is really hot out, right? Because that's not the optimal time to water. It's kind of like if, you, um, if you're going to go to the gym and like run on the treadmill and you go and you run and you're like, oh, I forgot to hydrate. Like I need to hydrate now. I have a terrible headache. Yeah, you still got, you got to hydrate, but your headache's not going to go away, right? But you could have prevented that headache if you hydrated beforehand. So this is the time of year to hydrate your plants so that they can then do well in the summer. Um, depending on the species on your site, you may be able to do some supplemental watering during the first summer, maybe once or twice a month, but aim for cooler days, cooler times of day, early in the morning or late in the evening, and think about that mulch blanket and those nurse rocks, anything you can do to lower the soil temperature so that the plants can receive that water in cool conditions as much as possible. Let's see. Um, do you recommend organic fertilizers for native plants? Only in one situation, in a container. Yes, in a container. In the ground, no, don't do it. Yeah. And I, I'm speaking from personal experience. I've done it. So I know, okay. So in a container, native plants just go through what they have and they don't have the same like 
relationships with mycorrhizae that they might develop in a natural soil ecology. Um, so they don't have the extra support from those guys to help them maximize nutrients. So they just run through the available nutrients in their containers really quickly. So in container culture, so that's me at the nursery, that's you if you're growing them in pots at home, yes, do go ahead and, and fertilize. Um, if they're in the ground and you try to fertilize them, you'll get like a bump of new growth and then you will get so many aphids and white fly and all kinds of pest issues and uh, probably some like deformed growth too because they just grow too fast. They're just not, they just don't need it and it's like unhealthy for them. So don't fertilize unless it's a container. How about in the garden for pest issues? Do you have anything you recommend? Shifting your paradigm to be accepting of pests. <laughs> That's uh, generally the way that I go with it, but I'm like a big wildlife habitat nerd, right? So, um, good pests versus bad pests. Yeah, I mean, these are very good, valid questions. So I think the one, the one place where I will sometimes use like a chemical is I'll put out a boric acid ant trap because I'm not a big fan of Argentine ants. They're a pain in my butt. Uh, because they farm aphids and mealybugs on my plants, and I'm not crazy about that. Um, but in general, let's say if I like want to clean up a plant so that it looks like nice and ready to go out the door to its new home, it's covered in aphids, right? Um, I'll rinse the aphids off with water. If it's like a very bad infestation, maybe I'll use like a little rubbing alcohol and um, dish soap, which is the desiccant, so it just like kills the aphids, and then I'll rinse all that off with water. It's not worth it to me to um, to risk like injuring the beneficials by using pesticides on uh, most of the um, most of the pest insects, and um, to the point even that like if we get a plant in that has a spider mites on it, spider mites are horrible. They spread really easily. They like dusty conditions. Um, I will sacrifice that plant. That plant will go away. And I'd rather not have to spray like pyrethrins, even though that's an organic pesticide, it's detrimental to pollinators and I don't wanna risk it. So um, I will occasionally sacrifice a plant for the benefit of my pollinator friends. But the other thing that I will say is we do, we have aphids at the nursery. Everybody's got aphids at their nursery. If there's no aphids there, I'd be a little concerned. Um, so we do try to stay on top of them by rinsing them off of the plants. But what I've noticed is if we, overlook them or in our um, demonstration garden. A lot of times we just let pest management take its own course. Um, we get like one day, tons of aphids. Two days later, the aphids are gone and there's ladybugs everywhere. Or the other thing that's really fun, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but um, they look like shiny little like pearlescent, it's hard to describe, but they're basically aphid mummies. So if you leave your aphids around, um, it's food for predatory wasps that will lay their eggs inside of the aphids. So they're teeny, teeny, tiny. And then the larva eats the aphid from the inside out and then hatches out. And it leaves the exoskeleton of the aphid with a tiny exit hole. It looks like a, like a little a bead that you might like find on a very fine necklace. And you'll just see like a hundred of those on a plant. And you're like, <laughs> what went down here like at this microscopic level it's pretty gnarly um but that's the kind of thing that if you you know change your paradigm don't spray for pesticides you'll start to see this really cool biodynamic dynamicism happening in your garden so great thanks for all those i know we're running close on time here um maya do you want to talk about what's going to happen what's going to happen next or what we have upcoming with Nature Hood or yeah. Well, I mean, the back end, what they'll get emailed and all that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is being recorded um, and we will put it on our YouTube channel and all registrants, even if you didn't attend this webinar, you'll all get the recording, um, the URL recording. Um, and yeah, feel free to email us if you have any additional questions and I don't know, Nicole, if you feel comfortable sharing your contact info, but um, we can yeah, follow. Totally. we'll have a follow up email as well to all registrants as well. Yeah, you guys are welcome to reach out to me with any plant questions. Um, probably the easiest way is by email to artemisia nursery at gmail.com. 
pretty straightforward. Um, it is a shared email with me and my coworkers. So it's a great place to ask your fellow plant nerds plant nerd questions. We're always happy to help troubleshoot or plant ID, insect ID. Yeah, any questions that you have, we're, we're interested. So go ahead and drop us a line. Thank you. Yeah. And then next month, May 5th, we're going to have a Nature Herd Garden chat about backyard community science with our own Jose Esparza um, and other folks as well chiming in about backyard community science. So look out for emails for that as well. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you guys so much. This yeah, is really so fun. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks everybody who braved be sitting inside during the heat during all this. Yeah. It's a rough day for that. Yeah. All right. Great. Hi, everyone. Bye.